Hello and welcome. We are Third Coast Percussion, and uh, what we've just played for you is a very short excerpt from a piece entitled Third Construction by the American composer John Cage. And we're going to play a slightly longer excerpt for you a little bit later. But we wanted to start with that specific excerpt of the piece because it contains within it an idea that we'd like to share with you today. Now, our ensemble, Third Coast Percussion, is a chamber music ensemble. So uh, chamber music comes from the classical music world. But chamber music ensembles notably do not contain this iconic figure of the classical music world, the conductor. Uh, and for a lot of people, this is the first image that comes to mind when they think about classical music, this singular authoritative figure who uh, unifies the sound of an orchestra and steers the musical direction. We do not have that. And so even though we have some things in common with the symphony orchestra, we also have things in common with, say, a rock band, because without a conductor, all of the musical decision making, all of the unification and the determination of the direction has to come from within the group. Like a symphony orchestra, however, we play pre-composed, notated music. So there's a composer who writes down their piece of music. It comes to us, and it's up to us as performers to realize and interpret this score in performance. So despite its unconventional instrumentation, Third Construction is a notated piece of music like this. You notice we're not actually using any sheet music today. That's only because over the course of about 300 plus performances of this piece, we've memorized it. But uh, there is a score. <laughs> it doesn't look so different from sheet music you might see in other contexts. Um, as you can see it here, there's a lot of information on this page. So for each of the four of us, we have directions as to what instruments we're playing at a given time. A lot of uh, rhythmic information, a lot of rhythms, some of which are very complicated. Dynamic markings, which indicate soft. Tempo markings, which indicate faster and slower passages of the piece, etc. So some of you might be thinking, how do you guys stay together without having a conductor? Um, and uh, not only do we stay in constant nonverbal communication uh, in order to remain together in certain spots in the music, but we also have to make endless decisions during the rehearsal process about how to shape the music. For instance, what is going to be climactic and what is going to relax. In this particular piece, Third Construction, we're playing on instruments that are not thought to have traditional pitch or the tones that make up melodies and harmonies. So how do we uh, decide which voices are in the lead and which can play a more supporting role? So the answer to all of these questions is simple. We compromise. So compromise is a very complex and complicated word. When we're little, we're taught that compromise is a virtue. We tell children that they can't always get what they want. They need to play nice and they need to share. But as adults, we often send a different message in our daily lives. We romanticize uncompromising behavior. So we did a Google search of that term, uncompromising. And we gained insight through the autofill results for the search about how the wor world perceives that phrase. And the last few are particularly telling. We look up to those with uncompromising integrity and uncompromising work ethic. The behavior itself of being uncompromising is actually exciting to us, even heroic. But what do we lose if we idolize an uncompromising hero? Needless to say, we live in a world where Choosing to compromise or not to compromise in contexts such as our government, work, school, and especially with our friends and family have very real and tangible consequences. We wanted to talk to you all about compromise today because for the four of us, it's a completely unavoidable part of our daily lives. Um, we have no conductor, so we have no leader, we have no boss. So we have to take our four very different personalities, our four different backgrounds, our four different egos, and our four different voices, and to bring them together and speak with one voice from the stage. And we don't mind telling you it's a real pain. And um, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, uh, because all of you have had to compromise something. You've all had to make 
a compromise that was difficult to swallow, whether in your work or in your studies or in your personal lives. But we did want to give you a glimpse into our compromises and our, our daily work in this area. So this is what eight measures of my part uh, in this piece that we're playing for you, Third Construction, looks like. And at this point in the piece, I'm playing on the clave, and it sounds like this. Now, I happen to think that's some pretty groovy clave music. Um, <laughs> I love this little section of the piece. It's actually very fun to play. However, you all are the very first audience to have ever heard this music. Because while I'm playing this clave rhythm, at the exact same time, Peter and Sean are also playing on their claves. And they're playing completely different rhythms. Suddenly, the music is completely different. And my clave rhythm, which I love, becomes just one third of this sort of cloud of clave sound. Now, when we first rehearsed this piece, I might have campaigned with my colleagues. I might have asked Peter and Sean if they would mind playing a little bit quieter and letting me play a little bit louder <laughs> so that this rhythm, which I know is interesting on its own, could be heard. Uh, but now let's add in the fourth player. So this is the same passage of music with all four of us playing. suddenly we realize that all of the clave music that's happening is really just background material to the epic solo that Rob is taking on the IKEA spaghetti strainers, which sounds wonderful. <laughs> and my clave rhythm, which again is very interesting on its own, will never be fully heard or fully understood by any audience that we perform for. So that's an insight into some musical compromises that we make on a daily basis. But that's just eight seconds worth of music. Uh, that piece is about 10 minutes long, so we're talking about 1% of that piece. And this year alone, Third Coast is going to play about 50 pieces of music for roughly 26 hours of music. That's a lot of group decision making and compromising. But uh, w since we are full time, as this is our job, we have to compromise on many other things as well, such as where we're going to live, what our daily schedule is, when we can take vacations, what the goals of our organization are. So you can quickly see that group compromise and decision making is inherent to something that creates valuable meaning and a substantial part of both of our artistic and personal lives. Now there's another word that is interchangeable with compromise, and that is collaboration. Collaboration is a term with much more uh, positive connotations generally, right? Everyone likes to think of themselves as good collaborators. Collaboration seems a very useful thing to do, sometimes even a fun thing to do. But we don't put collaboration on a, a pedestal of any kind. We don't romanticize collaboration. It's not a romantic idea. But genius is a romantic idea. And so genius is the story that we tell about where great things come from. And in the arts, for instance, uh, we think about the Sistine Chapel and we think about uh, Michelangelo's artistic vision and his great accomplishment as an individual. Uh, but of course, this is a, a gigantic project. Michelangelo did not work completely alone. He had many assistants. Uh, purportedly, Michelangelo hired and fired those assistants on a pretty regular basis. So when the project was done, none of their names uh, would be associated with the finished work. Likewise, we apply the narrative of genius to technological innovation. So uh, Thomas Edison, is the inventor of the light bulb, and the inventor of the phonograph, and the inventor of the motion picture camera, and hundreds of other inventions. Uh, he had over a thousand patents to his name by the end of his life. Uh, but again, when we tell this story, we tend not to remember that a lot of those, uh, some of his greatest inventions were improvements on technology that had already been developed. And also, he had an entire research uh, and development staff working for him in his labs in Menlo Park. It's interesting to note that Edison made arrangements to legally hold the patent himself for any technology that was developed at Menlo Park, regardless of whose work was going into it. And maybe this is just 
human nature because we all love the idea of a genius. and We all love imagining the lone artist slaving away in their studio towards their singular vision without compromise for anything or anyone. But what is lost when the message that we send to our future generation of artists and inventors and our future entrepreneurs and our future leaders is that compromise is a weakness and that collaboration is second to genius. How many great ideas will never come to light if we never compromise and if we refuse to collaborate? For the four of us, compromise and collaboration is unavoidable. And sometimes it can be very messy. Making chamber music together is a very intimate process and it's very, can be very emotional. And um, like all compromise and all collaboration, sometimes it's not pretty. We're actually sharing some very polite collaborations and compromises <laughs> with you today. I promise you it gets much worse than this. Um, but those compromises and those collaborations are the only way that the four of us can make the music that we believe in so much and that we've dedicated our lives to making. We want to thank you for letting us share our compromises with you today. We're going to finish by playing. This is also from Third Construction by John Cage. Thank you. 
Wow, I know I speak for everyone when I say that that was amazing. And you did pretty much everything except toot your own horn. So I'm going to <laughs> do a little bit of that now. So you are Third Coast Percussion, mm. a Chicago-based ensemble that has performed hundreds of concerts across the country and engages in groundbreaking cross-disciplinary residency work with a wide range of disciplines. And I know that in July 2012, you were named Noda Jane's Ensemble in Residence here. So we're very lucky to have you. And that was never Thanks. compromise, collaborate. <laughs> so <clears throat> I know I speak for everyone when I say that was amazing. I know that I don't speak for everyone when I say that most of my musical knowledge is derived from Disney pop princesses. <laughs> so um, I recognize the conch shell from mm -hmm. The Little Mermaid, but could you tell me something about your other instruments? Sure. Uh, this is a piece that I, I think does a great job of I think summarizing a lot of what percussion is about, because there are a variety of instruments that we see as being typical uh, instruments at this point, cowbells, uh, tom-toms, as well as a variety of instruments that come from a variety of world cultures. So the conch shell, for, inst for instance, Polynesian instrument, there it goes. Um, <laughs> uh, Peter was also playing on what are called pu'ili ili, which are these uh, split pieces of bamboo. Uh, but on top of that, there are also ordinary household objects that are uh, sort of discovered sounds. So we each have a set of five cans that we're playing on. We've each made our own decisions about what kind of cans those will include. Mm -hmm. Wow, in listening to you talk during the performance, I was really struck by the language of compromise and collaboration. Mm. And this is something that we all do, no matter what we're working in. And I was wondering, when you come to those tense moments mm -hmm. of collaboration. Yes. <laughs> How is it that you adjudicate in those tough disputes? Yeah. I think a lot of it, uh, you know, I feel very lucky that I, I work in a group with three very bright and very reasonable human beings. Um, and so trust plays a very large part in, in being able to make these compromises. I think we all can take the large view that we understand ultimately where our goals are the same. Um, so that plays a large role. I think it's we also, as musicians and I think artists of many kinds, you sort of develop a, a sense of willingness to be criticized in a way. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big part of how you become good at what you do is that you, you, practice, you go to lessons and mm -hmm. classes and whatever, and you do what you think is good, and then someone else offers their insights into it. And so uh, while the, the power shift obviously is uh, much different than what you would do when you're studying as a student learning mm -hmm. music, the, you sort of develop the, you separate the personal from uh, from opinions about the way things are going to unfold. As a, as a group of four also, I think we are pretty good at maybe looking to the rest of the group. If two people have a disagreement about things or mm -hmm. are looking to make a decision about things, we try out all the different possibilities. Let's try it with you playing your part louder. Let's see what that mm -hmm. sounds like. Okay, now let's try it this way that I thought was, was cool. And what do mm -hmm. you guys think about that? Um, but most of all, I think it's, there's a lot of taking your own ego out of the equation um, mm -hmm. and trying to remember what you're doing in the service of the music. Um, and so it's never about winning, and the criticisms are never about anything personal, mm -hmm. you know, and the, those compromises and disagreements mm -hmm. become very much about trying to find an answer that works well for everyone. Yeah, there, that's definitely <laughs> a valuable lesson that I think we could all use, say, you know, faculty meetings. <laughs> um, so you'll be here January 26th. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about what you'll be doing then? Absolutely. So the, the first thing that we hear from a lot of people after a concert is, I've never heard anything like that before, which is a, a cool thing, because I think that's what we strive for. So this, this performance on January 26th involves, uh, well, one piece that literally no one has ever heard before, because it's uh, a completely brand new piece by a young composer named Timothy Andres. Um, that the DeBartolo Center has commissioned, and it is a sort of transformation of a, one of Johann Sebastian Bach's keyboard pieces, one of his two-part inventions, reimagined for all the broad variety of sounds that are included in a percussion ensemble. So we're playing it on ratchets and scrapers, um, as well as pitched xylophones and marimbas and things like that. And then it also kind of takes its own tangents and goes in some new artistic directions. Other pieces on the program will feature us uh, performing with stones, uh, with amplified tabletops, and uh, as well as some of the more traditional pitched instruments, marimbas and vibratones and things like that. We also have a wonderful uh, collaboration with uh, Carmen Helena Tejas, who some of you saw earlier today, and uh, some other vocalists for a piece called Proverb by Steve Rice that involves, in involves five vocalists as well as the, the four of us. Thank you. One last question. Don't think about it at all. Motley Crue or Bon Jovi? Uh, bon Jovi? Okay, correct. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rob. <laughs>